Welcome to another episode of Arthritic Bourbon Bikers. We're here today. It's been a little bit since we've done a podcast. And several things have happened. Number one, we've had not one, but two snows already this year. Yeah. Which is un- unbelievable. Silly. Like way too early for us to have snow in Missouri, but it's happened, yes. right? And that coupled with a myriad of other things has delayed our podcast routine. Life catches up sometimes, right? It does. It gets ahead sometimes. Yeah. But that hasn't stopped you from biking. No. Yeah. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, well, we could, we could probably talk for days on bad decisions. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I was kind of uh, inspired a little bit the other day because I did some cold weather stuff, even though I try, I try to minimize that. But I, I wanted to really, you know, grab some of the remaining warm weather and then it got cold. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about these particular items. Last time we did an episode, we did talk a little bit about cold weather biking. Yep. We talked a little bit about gear and so forth. And this is an example of some gear mm-hmm. that you've been playing around with. This is you know, year two, right? Yep, it is. And mm-hmm. so what do you call these things? Okay. I mean, obviously the name here says yeah. it all, but These bar are bar mitts. Some people call them pogies. There might be a brand name pogies too, but I think there are different different models um, and you know they they kind of adapt them to the different type of handlebars too people way up north and snowmobile guys aren't going to be unfamiliar with these things Um, but these I bought they're made of neoprene and you know you've got a you got to sort of jimmy them on the handlebars I don't have flat bars I think these are really good for flat bars with maybe a bar end but what I did is I have those crazy bars that if you unzip the end here and you undo the Velcro, they'll sort of work around the the outer part of the bar and go around the shifter and the brake. Okay, so the idea here is, for those who are watching this on video on YouTube, this is just some little Velcro straps here, and then there's also this little zipper, right, on the end. Yep. So basically this gives you a little bit of opening, not to mention, like you said, these are neoprene, mm-hmm. and it's a pretty heavy neoprene. It's thick. Mm-hmm. So if you're a if you're a diver or you've worn any wetsuits, this is like really heavy wetsuit, you know, material. This would be, this would definitely affect your buoyancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these, then you just slide them kind of over the bar, right, and kind of up over the shifter, so you can get your hand up in there. And then you can zip and sort of Velcro these down as best you can. And then hands go inside here on the bars. Yeah. With or without a glove. With or without a glove. Sometimes you don't, you may not need much of a glove with this kind of a setup. That's what I discovered. A um, little reflective material on there too. That's yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. Because they do, if you look end on, it's kind of funny. You know, they kind of look like wings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's got like, like your bike's got a mustache. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've seen the, I've not seen ones like this out of neoprene, mm-hmm. but I have seen these that are more kind of like f- fuzzy lined and stuff, right? So they have different styles of these? Yeah, I've seen some with just snaps and things. Uh, these were cheap. I really can't remember how much I paid for them, but I will tell you that this is very, uh, it seems to be moisture resistant, of course, and it's wind resistant. The only area really of weakness is down here where the zipper is. So if you've got to rig it up, you know, I, I, and I, and I did have to do that, you know, the zipper might not close all the way. You might have a little, you may not be able to close the Velcro either, but if nothing else, you can kind of shove a little bandana in there to keep the wind from sneaking through. Gotcha. Because I did some, I did some riding, um, without gloves simply because I need to be able to use my phone. Work, on, work with my phone up when I'm riding and answer a call or whatever. Yeah. And so you, you don't want to be taking gloves off because sometimes those gloves that say they re- respond to a, a phone screen don't really do a good job. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm real happy with these. That's interesting. And so underneath these, you're wearing some other kinds of gloves with them, right? Mm-hmm. What, what is your choice? I've tried these real lightweight stuff that are almost like a liner. Uh, but I've also tried some almost ski style gloves. I tried some some lobster gloves too. <clears throat> it's real cold, and I ventured out a little bit in some pretty cold stuff, 
I'll still need some of that. I'm a bit of a baby when it comes to my, my hands. They get cold. Oh, yeah. So. Well, I mean, you, uh, you're happy with these, though? I am. Do you have any ballpark what the cost of these were? I want to say 70 or 80 bucks for the pair. Okay. So, it's, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a commitment. Uh, may have been more. I, I don't recall. But if you're, and you got these at a local bike shop? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to ride in cold weather, this is a huge part of cold weather riding because your hands are going to take a lot of, of the the brunt of like air if there's any moisture at all whether it's rain or snow or whatever coming off tires or whatever i mean your hands really get cold um fingers and stuff well, yeah and you're just holding them you know you're, so you're not moving you're not doing anything most of the time you know you'll shift and hit brakes but if you're just sitting there and you've wind just beaten because you know if you like to ride any 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 distance and you know sometimes i'll ride three or four hours man you will just not be able to use your hands right so this this is a real game changer if you're doing that kind of cycling so you're giving these a recommendation absolutely yeah a hearty recommendation these are made by bar mitts for those who are just listening and not watching the video uh it's the brand it looks like bar mitts again they're a heavy neoprene i could certainly see how they'd be warm um but I do think you'd have to have the right glove on underneath to really be able to yeah. take advantage of that too. Cause I could see, like you're talking about, I could see the potential for some air to sneak in, depending on how your handlebars mm -hmm. are designed or laid out. Um, and I, and you know, we talked a little bit about this, but I don't know if they make something like this for drop bars. I'm sure something exists. I just don't know. I think they do. I saw some, um, and they're a little funny looking. They, they have a little different angle here and they, they taper quite a bit yeah. at the end. It's a funny looking, um, Mitt, but uh, the other thing that you can you can get into is if you look, these are large, but there's not a whole bunch of room in there. If you do have a big bulky glove, yeah, you know you might have a little trouble finding your shifters and stuff like that. You know, if it's a if you've got a twist shifter, I can imagine that might be a little bit of a, of a problem. Or if you've got you know shifters that are not the traditional trigger style or you know bar style that are down the bar ends or something mm -hmm. that might not work, but yeah, it's an interesting thing. I've certainly seen that Revelate Designs makes something like this as well. I think they're kind of the furry ones, more for yeah. maybe mountain bike or fat bike style riding. A lot of people ride fat bikes in the wintertime just because yeah. of the big tires, snow, ice, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really great, uh, that's a great tip for cold weather riding. Yeah. And you've found these just are working out okay. What's a, What was like coldest temperatures you were riding in? Well, I did get down to the just uh maybe high 20s low 30s which is pretty darn cold for me but uh yeah. i was out for a while well and you're doing that riding that means you got you know 20 mile an hour 10 mile an hour winds at least yeah. assuming it's not blowing yeah i mean it got to the point where my my toes were the worst part you know my, my feet yeah, needed so more attention what kind of strategies are you looking at for your feet because i mean extremities are the parts that get the coldest obviously if you talked about face and having a you know, some cover for the face yeah. and the ears and all that stuff. But you know, hands and feet are, are big things. And you've talked about hands, but what are your, what are you thinking on the on the foot? It's funny you'd ask because I was just uh, doing some single track with with a guy we know, Brad Eifert. On the Fargo. <clears throat> on the Fargo, yeah. It was, I was a little worried because I didn't have a suspension fork. Yeah. But I got We're going to talk about that in a minute, though. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so he bought these uh, cold weather mountain biking boots, five tens that. Uh, uh, I think Adidas bought the company. Okay. So technically, they're an Adidas product, and so I I ordered some. Um, so my my approach is going to be some uh, some uh, Captain Bob endorsed darn tough socks. Love Those darn socks. love darn tough. I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna put them in these. Uh, put, then put my foot right in one of those cycling boots and see how that goes. They do have covers to keep wind off your feet too. Oh, so kind of, are they sort of like the same thing, neoprene style? Similar, I think. I've seen some different products Bontrager and what others make, but. So you just kind of wrap around the top of your shoe or whatever to sort of just give a little wind break? Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna try not to do that, but. Yeah. I'm a... I think that's a big part of it is the wind. If you can keep the wind, you can usually get some insulative value, but like so many shoes, I mean, and frankly, because most of the time we want shoes to breathe. So therefore that naturally is gonna let some, some air in and that's where, really get your feet cold. Yeah, it's pretty much, uh, you, you gotta kinda choose, and I had underestimated that until I just took some long rides in the cold, and yeah. you know, um, my, my, my nose, fingers, and toes. 
Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, That's the stuff you want to keep warm, dry and warm as best you yeah, can. Yeah. And, you, and you really can't hardly beat wool when it comes to, you know, <clears throat> absorption, wicking away, sweat and all those kind of things. I mean, this is about as good as you can get. Yeah, yeah. And, well, some people even layer up a couple wool socks if it's really cold. Yeah. Uh, I thought about it, too. I've talked to some guys recently who they'll, uh, they'll do that, put a couple of socks on, and they'll take those little hand warmer rectangles, open them up in the air, and... Shove them in there somehow. Yeah. If you have a shoe that'll take the extra space, you can even do that. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, if you really can go out in the cold, cold, and I don't know how brave I am um, with that, but mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get some rides in in the consistently in the cold weather this year. And we've had some ridiculously cold temperatures for this early. I mean, the other day we got up, it was like six degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah. Fahrenheit. <clears throat> that's that's bloody cold for that's us. Yeah. For us, that's cold. Mm -hmm. Especially this early. Yeah, well, the other day I was riding, it was 60. Yeah. And then it just, you know, Missouri's just well, both. And two, da two days from now, it's going to be back to 50 again, they're saying, in the 50s. So yeah. it's, that's, the weather goes up and down here pretty rapidly, especially this time of year. Yeah. But this is definitely early for us. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So the shoes, those are, uh, you, had, you ordered some, they're kind of like a boot, yeah. uh, made for cold weather stuff and, um, what do they cost? Are they expensive or is this a normal? Uh, they're not cheap. Uh, these are probably like 120, 140, depends on what you're getting. Okay, so like a high-end pair of tennis shoes. Yeah, and they just look like high tops. Um, but the guys out at Triathletics were telling me that they... Um, That's a local bike shop. Yep, local, uh, really, try for kind of triathletes. I think they do a lot of... Uh, the owner was a former triathlete. I don't know if he yep. still does, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. Steve is um, his name. But yeah, they uh, they do a good job with the gear they carry. But they were telling me that the the bottom of these shoes do a real good job of gripping the spikes on your flat pedals. Okay. Which is another thing I'm after. Right. <clears throat> so I did run into a little bit of an issue this this last weekend doing some. Yeah, they're one of our local bike shops. They're like a Kona dealer, and I think they've got maybe a couple other brands. I don't know what they else. They used to they do Cannondale. I'm not sure if they still do, but anyway, but they also do a lot of shoes. And Steve is. The guy who's the owner, he was like, uh, again, a triathlete, but also really for years has been a run, just a runner a lot too. So he's really supposed to be good at fitting shoes for people who run and so forth. But they've, they they kind of specialize a little bit in stuff. Well, I think so. And, and, and you know, uh, there were two gentlemen working there. And as soon as I brought that up, it was, it was funny. They just perked up. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. And they came over. It was really a, yeah. an enthusiastic consumer experience yeah and, and it's about. cool when you see people who they're really just enjoy yeah. like talking about the gear and getting in like when they're trying to solve a problem basically yeah no in educate essence, you. you know they'll yeah and those guys are pretty knowledgeable there it seems like yeah it was kind of fun you know to to have that you know you've all been somewhere you're gonna you're gonna drop some cash on something and you just feel like you had a lukewarm response well these guys were in fact one of the very first bikes i bought in columbia was from triathletics yeah yeah i still have that bike yeah. Yeah. I don't ride it much, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that? They, Univega. Univega. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was originally sold to me by Steve twenty seven years ago. Yeah. Six years ago. Twenty six years ago. Yeah. yeah. He's still around. Pretty pretty good guy. Yeah. Awesome. Pretty decent bike shop. All right. So you got some bar mitts, you got some some boots. Yeah. And so you've been out doing some riding, but you bring up single track. Let's talk about what spurred this a little bit was, you know, you talked about wintertime riding last time and you were going for some tires. Yep, yep. So you got the tires in, got the tires on. Yep. So you're rolling some what? Some Terravail Honchos. On what size? These are 27 and a half. 27.5s. And I'm happy with them. So, you know, I have a 29 set I can put on and the 27 and a half with the tires I want on them. And they're spaced, you know, with the the the, uh, the disc and everything. So Walt's took care of that for me. All I got to do, even I can swap them out. So you've Let's got a so. you've got a complete just switch out set now, basically. Yeah, so yeah. you can go from kind of your trail touring tire to yeah. your sort of mountain back bike style tire. Yeah. Now, in all fairness, this is one of the great flexibilities of the Fargo. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you can just, you have so much flexibility with tire sizes. You can go like, what, up to three, three and three plus? On I bet you can. I bet so. Three, yeah. at least a three inch maybe? I think so. I'd have to 
check for sure, but on the 27 and a half, you can probably go three. Yeah, yeah that's, what I'm, that's what I was thinking is, it's like three, and then of course you got all different sizes in between. So how has that been since you switched to that tire? I liked it. I tell you what, but the other day when it was when it was uh, was warmer, I switched out and went on a on a longer ride because I like to keep the twenty seven and a halfs with like a hard pack tire, keep the pressure high, so it's not as much rolling resistance. I'm going to really appreciate that too. But so then I put on the uh, twenty seven and a halfs with the Honchos. They're two point six wide. It's a big tire. Yeah. And they got some pretty good lugs on them too. Oh yeah, it's meaty, and uh, so it's it's a hard work pushing that down the trail. But I really appreciated it at Rockbridge State Park, which is a pressure. local single track kind of. It's a park that has some single track tracks out there. Yeah, quite a bit. And you get to the very back, you'll see a full parking lot, and you get to the back, and you know you're not finding any people. You're wondering where they are. So you went out and did some single track riding yeah, with our buddy Brad Eifert. He gave me the kind of the the tutorial the. And the tour, yeah. it was, man, it was fun. I had a great time. Yeah. I did have to dismount a couple times. I, yeah. you know. Lowered the pressure. Yeah. No suspension, obviously. You're just running the stock. Far no, far I do have a little thud far. buster on the seat post. Little, takes a little jarring out of it. Did that help? But, uh, I think so. I think so. But, uh, yeah, I was surprised at how the rigid fork did with, with big beefy tires with a lot of gimp into them. It really did well. I was, I was impressed. That's good. I was happy with it. Plan yeah. to go back as soon yeah. as I can. Very cool. Well, that's a that's a cool setup. I mean, the, the ability just to switch out easily because really, if you can stick it up on your bike stand and just swap them out fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a pretty quick process. And <clears throat> then the probably the hardest part is just you know um, remembering not to hit the brakes when you don't have anything in the in the in the hydraulic brake uh, disc thing. You don't want to have to pry those apart. Right. <clears throat> and um, just find a place to put your extra wheel set. Yeah, storage, all right. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's good. That's good. So I'm pretty happy with it overall. Tips. It sounds like you're enjoying some of the cold weather stuff, even with even with the asthma and stuff. You seem like yeah. you've done pretty well. Yeah, I'm doing okay. I still am not dialed in with the rest of my, my gear. I did buy a layer, like a base layer of Capilene. Um, and, you know, I still, I don't know, I still have this issue with, you know, a couple layers, whether it's, so tech wear or, or merino wool, a couple layers of that, and then you need a windbreak. And so I put on a windbreak. I, don't, I probably don't have the right piece of gear yet because then it holds all the moisture in and I'm still pretty, pretty wet if I stop. Because, you know, I like to go for a while, stop, get coffee or get lunch or something. And, and you, you know, you take off a layer or two and you're still, I don't know, I'm still not there. That's maybe something we could ask that somebody could maybe give us some feedback on out there you know, tell us some things you're thinking about when it comes to, what do you find works well for an outer layer in cold weather riding? Like, Because obviously you're gonna build up heat and sweat. I mean, one of the things you and I talked about personally was that I wondered if having a outer layer with like pit zips that you could open up, maybe a little, little bit of air flow in and out, because this is kind of where a lot of heat comes from, I think, yeah. for me anyway. Mm -hmm. When I'm riding, you know, I'm kind of up in here and sometimes my lower back I'm just wondering if there's a way to have an outer layer that you can let a little bit of air flow through, but it'll still block a lot. And it's adjustable. So if you're cold, you can close it up a little more or open it a little more. And that's one thing I think yeah, might be a tip, but I'd be interested if anybody else out there has any info about why, what they would suggest. Yeah. Because certainly you can put as many base layers, you know, base layers and, and additional layers on. And no matter, I know you've got wool and all kinds of options fleece. to use, fleece and all kinds of yeah. things, but if it gets damp, then you're gonna be cold. The other thing that I think of is that when you when you stop, are you shedding those layers immediately to kind of not, to let yourself cool yeah. and dry or? I have felt I needed to, yeah. you know? Cause I was doing a, I had this, this uh, fleece zip up jacket. It's a really good warm piece to have, but it still needs some wind resistance or some, you know, wind protection. And nah, I just, like I said, I haven't, haven't figured it out, but that's part of the fun is, is right. trying to figure it out. It's kind of sorting through and working on the gear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, the other thing I've, I went to a couple of these bike shops and I looked at their dedicated cycling pants that are pretty um, just with or without padded seat. I don't, you know, really care for the padded seat, but um, some of those, 
I, I just, I, st I still have a philosophical issue that I, I would rather dress in sort of versatile outdoor clothes, like these REI pants or whatever, and get there. Because if I'm going to, I might be biking to a place, I'm going to go to Oktoberfest or something. And, you know, I, I may not really want to have the cycling gear on the whole time or something. It's one of those dilemmas that we deal with as touring type. Our, our style is touring style, not really just cycling, you know, even though a lot of the cycling is exercise related, but really our style is more touring style. Yeah. And a lot of that involves the adventure of going to the places when you arrive, whether it be restaurants or shops, towns, yeah, that kind of stuff. And sometimes historical sites. historical sites or whatever. And sometimes you want that casual look. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of touring people, even in the summertime, they'll wear non-traditional cycling gear, I'll call it. So they might wear a button-up shirt because it, it's loose and breathes well, but it also fits in if you need to just yeah. duck into a nice place or all kinds of different things. It's just more flexible. Yeah. Well, I've considered, you know, we've talked about some of this. I've, I've kind of long wanted to pack up the bike for a long tour and then just take it somewhere and then go and then stay. Stay for three, four, five days or a week, wherever that is. Yeah. And then you're, you know, you're using non-cycle gear where, you know, yeah. I really want it to be kind of a means of transportation. It is tough to be able to, you, you can only carry so much stuff. So you can't have like 15 changes of clothes or whatever. So you really got to have stuff that's quick drying, easy to wash, even in a sink if you need to. It's almost kind of like backpacking mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. in that same way. Uh, but you need something that you can go out to a decent meal at yeah. a decent restaurant and not get hassled because yeah. you're wearing bike clothes or whatever. Yeah. With big padded pants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great point. Well, that's good. Sounds like you're kind of tuning your gear, kind of getting your stuff, working with different things. What's the next thing after the shoes? I mean, the shoes are, you're wait, are you still waiting on those? Yeah, they haven't called me, so okay. they're not in so yet. those are on order. Yeah. But what, what's next? Is it a jacket of some sort, you think? It might or? be, it might be that, because I think I can get by with the pants and the base layers I have on the, the kind of the britches area. Um, I've got plenty of wool socks that I can, of different thickness. Yeah. So I think it's really possibly a jacket, I'm guessing. Because you've got layer, like I know you've got a lot of different layer layering options. Really, I think it comes to wind, yeah. windbreak type stuff. So. And, you know, if it's too... If it's too wet, you know, I'm always going to decide if I'm really wanting to go out in it or not. But I have, I have layers for that, but the one I'm using, boy, it's just too... I don't think it's meant for cycling. Probably not. You know, so that's, that might be the next uh, thing I'll look into. And I don't know if maybe someone knows, do they make jackets that are specifically for cycling? I'm sure they do, but I just don't know. Yeah, like those features you're talking about. It's got to be yeah. something. I know a lot of hikers, a lot of backpackers and people have the pit zips. I've got a jacket like that. It's too big for cycling, though. It's a big Gore-Tex sort of adventure style, backpack style, hiker style jacket but it's pretty it's pretty heavy it's pretty bulky yeah i think you need something kind of lightweight yeah you know sort of yeah you know that's the trade-off with all these things all these items is you know you i don't mind cycling with a load but eventually it's too much yeah you know you do have to eventually uh decide is it worth taking this right this set of gear because man you're gonna be you can be pushing it. Well, and like so. we say, you know, around here the weather changes on a dime. So if you're out, it might be 20 degrees, 30 degrees one day, and tomorrow it might be 50 or 60 degrees. Yeah. yeah. And if you're out on a tour, you got to have a place to store all that stuff if you're not going to wear it that day. Right. Yeah. So all of this stuff that we deal with has to kind of pack up somehow or another. Yeah. Well, I've even had drastic shifts in a day because you know, once in a while I'll get a wild hair and I'll take off for the entire day. You know, yeah. and you know, I won't be riding hard the whole time, but I'll go and stop and, you know, it might be, might be six hours or so. And man, around here, the, <laughs> the temperature is changing so quickly. Oh, it can fluctuate 30 degrees. Yeah. So within, you got a bag, you shove it, shove it in the bag and, yeah. and you wonder, you know, uh, at some point you wonder, if, is it worth the effort pedaling all this stuff? And I'm right now, I'm loving it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a few it's more miles on these knees, it might be a problem. Yeah. It's part of the experimental phase two is figuring it out yeah looking at it yeah part of the fun is trying to learn what the gear is and stuff yeah what gear works what doesn't yeah, yeah. all right what else 
I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's anything really that's on, uh, on my mind unless I've had a senior moment. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. You know, one of the things I've been kicking around, I've been telling this guy that, you know, I'm really thinking this idea about having a wintertime project of buying a frame and building a bike. I have never in my life built a bike, but I have this thing where I think it would be fantastic just to have kind of a wintertime project and get like yeah. a frame. And even if I, uh, I fully realize I'm going to need to buy probably tools that are maybe more specific for bike. I've got tools, but not like bike specific tools. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have a bike stand, so I'm probably have to buy a bike stand so I can have it kind of mm -hmm. set up all the time. Yeah. But I'm seriously giving that con some some consideration. I'm thinking about a Fargo frame maybe, mm -hmm. and building one yeah. um, from the ground up. I think it might be kind of fun. It might be that I scrap the whole thing and say I don't, I can't do this, and take it to Waltz and have <laughs> Mark and the guys build the bike for me. After I'm like, no, nah, I'm out. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I tell you, I. Th I think it's so about I think, yeah, I'd, I'd like to watch it go down because uh, I love the I love the Fargo. Yeah. <clears throat> we were talking about how versatile it really is. Yeah, yeah. I think you'd like that. I've looked at a ton of different bikes over the years, like we all do. I'm sure every one of you out there, I know how you guys are. You guys are always looking at bikes. It's like when you're, when, no matter what you're into, whether it's computers or cameras or bikes or cars or whatever, you're always looking to see what the stuff's coming out. Yeah. I've looked at tons and tons of stuff, and there's a lot of great options out there right now for bikes, and yeah. uh, there's a lot of carbon options, like full carbon mm -hmm. stuff, you know, the, mm -hmm. the uh, Cutthroat just came out, the new Cutthroat. Um, there's a lot of great steel bikes, and, and obviously titanium is out there, but yeah. man, that's all stuff's all real pricey. Yeah. Um, but aluminum, you know, a lot of good. But a lot of aluminum bikes and so forth, yeah. So there's a lot of options out there. But what I started kind of looking at was, one of the things was geometry. Because mm -hmm. I really uh, appreciate, maybe that's the right word to use, I appreciate the geometry that the Fargo has. Mm -hmm. When you look at it and you really get into frame geometry, you notice that it's a, it very, is very much more of an upright uh, mm -hmm. position and sort of stem angle. And there's some great tools out there where you can compare different frames. So what you can do is you can select um, these frames or bikes and it'll show them on top of each other actually. Um, and you can see how the frames compare geometry wise. And I've looked at a ton of them. So I compare the Fargo to like Bomb Track, Bomb Track, if you're familiar with those guys. I've seen some. They're, they're more of a European company, but you can find them yeah, yeah. Uh, in the U.S. too. They're making some great stuff too. Yeah. But when you look at the, the geometry of their uh, one of their bikes, and I can't remember what it's called, the actual model, but anyway, it's their adventure kind of bike. Um, the geometry is almost identical to the Fargo. Is it? Okay. And that's yeah. I guess that's why I find it appealing. And when you look at the cutthroat, that geometry, while not quite as, not quite the same as the Fargo, it's very close to the same as the Fargo. Okay. I'm not opposed to that other than carbon is, I'm, I'm concerned about would I take care of it well enough or am I gonna abuse the carbon a little too much, the carbon frame? <clears throat> and then of course cost, holy cow, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. Whew. For me anyway, Yeah. carbon's expensive. Titanium's lovely, but that's pricey too. Yeah. And I just worry about someone stealing it too, honestly. Yeah. Someone knows what it is. I mean, you can yeah. put the best bike lock in the world on it, but we're gonna ride in places and... Yeah, you can really think about that. I know? do, I do think about that. Cause I know there are people who are out there willing to, you know, we talked about this, the, the thief's greatest tool is the DeWalt battery powered Sawzall. I swear, like they, you know, they can cut through locks and chains and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Not that we leave them in a lot of places sort of unattended overnight without taking them in, but we do leave them on the back of the car a lot of times and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I just always think about that, you know, a little bit about theft also. And I don't want to buy a, buy and or build a $5,000 bike mm -hmm. and then someone. Ride it twice and kiss it goodbye. Yeah, take off with it. I mean, you certainly, if there's one thing you'll learn if you start looking into this idea of building a bike is that you will, if you're looking to save money by doing that, 
don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. You will not save any money. You are better off money ahead to go and buy the bike with all the components on it and just ride it mm -hmm. and then change something if you need to. But if you are purely in it, like I'm thinking of the perspective of the process yeah. of having the project and building the bike and then on top of that, learning, sort of learning the, ins, the, the entire ins and outs of, of the bicycle, yeah. fully realizing it's going to cost me more money, it's going to cost me a ridiculous amount of time, mm -hmm. probably, that I'm going to have to buy tools and all kinds of things, and then I might even have to pay someone to help me figure it out, like Mark. I might have to go up there and say, Mark, I'm going to pay you, you know, an hour worth of time to show me how to do this because I can't yeah. figure it out or I don't know what I'm doing or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just about the... It's about the process, I think, as much as anything. Yeah, yeah you're going to get a finished product that you know, but on, I mean. Yeah, but the, I think the, the, the education would be worth it. In my, my first gut instinct about it would be. Yeah, I think it'd be some great content to create, too, to oh, yeah. put out there for people who might be interested. I've seen a few uh, video creators who have put together a complete series about building a bike from the ground up, and I think it'd be kind of fun from that perspective, too. But it also gives you the opportunity to sort of buy exactly the things you want without having to sort of scrap and replace and stuff like that. Because yeah. yeah. we all know that, you know, seats and seat posts and handlebars and heck, even some of the componentry and sometimes wheels and tires, we're all going to have different things we want and likes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't know. Well, the other thing, too, is now I've, <clears throat> I've switched out enough stuff on my bike that I have a pretty good starter set for another bike. <laughs> right. So you could, yeah, round two might be Jerry's Fargo in 29s, Jerry's Fargo in 27.5s. So that, yeah. you know, you yeah. don't want to waste all that time changing tires out. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, that might be fun too, but. Yeah. Anyway, that's something I'm considering. I have not pulled the trigger on that, but that's certainly a thought. You can get a you know, Fargo frame with the carbon fire starter fork, mm -hmm. I think retails a thousand bucks. And then you gotta buy all the components, you know, and yeah. stuff you want. What's well, so I wanted to mention, <clears throat> that the carbon fork. And maybe some folks that can kind of tell me, <clears throat> of course when I tell you what I'm about to say, you're gonna say, well you idiot, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and yeah, that's certainly true. So I had the Salsa anything Cages, not the metal ones, but the com composite stuff. Yep. And so I found they're softer than you think. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm tightening them up, take them on and off, because I didn't want to leave them on there when I have them back in the car, because it creates some wind resistance and they're bulky. So I was taking them on and off, and I was putting them on, and I was finding that there's not a real easy way to tell, okay, I've tightened it enough, you know? And so it's softer. So I, I kept smashing the, the stuff together, and it's just, it, I kind of messed one of them up. So the other thing I did is in tightening them, I caused one of the, the inlet uh, to be pressed a little bit too much and some of the paint chipped off on where the, where the carbon was painted. So everything looks structurally sound, so I don't think I've really damaged it too much, but it's aesthetically not pleasing now. And this beautiful purple fork, and I'm like, oh, look what I did. So, but I, I switched those out. I bought these more smaller almost use the term minimalist frames. Uh, they're uh, wide foot, they're called. They're made of aluminum, so they're much smaller. And so they just have the, the three hole sort of uh, geometry. I put them in there, really happy with those. I'm keeping them off. I'm not gonna take those off because they're small enough. Okay. <clears throat> but then what I did the other day, I had a little spill. <laughs> I had to dismount on the pavement, no obstacles at all, except I don't know what I was doing, daydreaming, picking my nose, what, I don't know, but I drifted to the, to the, uh, to the curb at such an angle and speed that I knew collision was inevitable. <laughs> so I was able to slow down as much as I could, plant my foot, lay it down relatively gently, and do a roll. Came up largely unharmed, disappointed to see nobody saw me, and <laughs> nobody was laughing or applauding, and, uh, but what I did is I, um, got a little more paint off the fork. I think that must have been it. Um, so, again, it doesn't look like there's any real damage done, but it's not as pretty. But then I thought to myself, well, it's like a scar. You know, I'm putting a lot of miles on the bike. Is it okay that I no longer have a pristine, unadulterated bike, but I've got one with a couple little, little scars? Well, 
One of the things I would say is that because it's on the carbon, obviously it's less important from a corrosion perspective. So you don't have to be concerned about that. If this was a part of the steel, I'd say you need to touch it up with something yeah. to keep corrosion from being an issue. But that's not the case with the carbon. Yeah. Yeah. So really, is it just an aesthetic thing? I think so. And it's down where it's, it's near you know, the axle, and so it's not like it's real visible, you know, but... So a little part of me just sort of cried for a moment. I thought, oh, look what I did. So I wonder if you could find touch-up paint for it. Yeah, I might look. I, I don't know. It's kind of a strange color, though, you know, but it's, you know, just a thought. Because, you know, as, as you go through, now I've had the bike a little over a year. <clears throat> and so, you know, you ride it. You lock it up places. You know, if you go and take it on an organized ride, it's going to get bumped. It's going to get knocked over. Uh, you're working on it it's gonna fall, you know, something's gonna happen all the time. And so I've had every one of these things happen. And then you crash. If you take it out single track and you're gonna hit something, you know, you're gonna hit a stump or a rock. And to me, that's okay. It's like a truck. I always said, if I get another truck, first thing I'm gonna do is go out and I'm gonna kick it in the tailgate and put a dent in it so I'm no longer worried about it. Right, right. Um, it's that first dent or ding is always the worst. Just go kick it, you know. Yeah. Um, and so there's part of me that's, you know, mourning the, uh, this new phase of the, of the bike. It's got a couple, you know, a couple scratches and dings, but I'm like, well, that's why I got it. That's yeah, why I got this yeah. particular bike, to sort of, to go out and tackle the trails and. So know. what is your question to the community? You said you kind of wanted to pose something to the community. Was there a question? Well, so I know a lot of folks, regardless of the type of bike, you know, you take good care of it, you clean it, you polish it and all these things. I saw a lot of guys in the middle of a ride doing this, okay? Um, the question is, should I be ashamed or proud of a couple of little scars? That is a good question. That's the question. Yeah, because I bet everybody's perspective is different. Some are going to view it like the truck yeah. mentality, which is, yeah, yeah that, you know, it's supposed to be dirty and muddy and scratched up and used and yeah. manly. And then some are going to want to treat it like a sports car, which yeah. is it's supposed to be clean and shiny Love and it. pretty. Yes, yeah. yeah, give us some feedback. We'd love to hear that. I'd like to know the answers to that question that everybody thinks because that's... Uh, that is an interesting... Yeah, not many things you can boil it down. It's either pride or shame. Yeah, right. Right? Right. right. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up then. Thanks for watching. As always, the podcast is available on all different kinds of platforms. We run it through Anchor, which is now owned, by the way, by SoundCloud. They bought Anchor. Really? Okay. But the same thing continues. They distribute and do all those things. And uh, also on YouTube, obviously. So if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. We're going to try to keep continuing with episodes. We certainly haven't done a fantastic job over the last month in getting them out. But we hope to continue to talk about some things. If, we, uh, if I do pull the trigger on a bike, we might have some of that content involved. Or if we come up with more items to talk about, we've got lots of different ideas yeah. for things. So thanks for following along. We appreciate it. We'll see you again in the next episode.